Today's episode of The Guilty Feminist is the second half of our show recorded at the London Palladium with Guardian Live on the 6th of February, celebrating the 100th anniversary of some women in the UK getting the right to vote. We're still raising money to develop Suffragettin, the hip-hop musical about the suffragettes, which you heard on last week's episode. So please go to kickstarter.com and search for Suffragettin to donate. Or check out the link on guiltyfeminist.com. The second half of this amazing show was opened by the ridiculously talented Ali McGregor. You'll also hear from the wonderful Hannah Gadsby, Margaret Cabon Smith, Bisha K. Ali, Jessica Foster Q, Zoe Williams, Ash Sarkar, Jess Phillips, Rachel Paris, Carrie Ed Lloyd, Felicity Ward, and the cast of Suffragettin. Enjoy. appearing at Soho Theatre with her multi-award winning show and Netflix special. That's right, if you haven't seen it yet, get down there and see it. It's magnificent. You probably haven't seen it because it was sold out. It's the wonderful Hannah Gatsby! Yeah, it hasn't sold out. <clears throat> <laughs> I want to 
talk about uh, one particular little suffragette event. 1914, Mary Richardson went to the National Gallery with a meat cleaver (laughs) and said hello with it seven times (laughs) to Velothkoth, Ropeby Venus, painting, nude woman. Now, it's a fairly, fairly aggressive act. Good honour. <laughs> she had her reasons. She said uh, she was responding to the arrest of a, a friend of hers the day before, Mrs Pankhurst. Don't know what her first name is. I'm reclaiming the missus. <laughs> She'd been arrested the day before. And Mary reckons she was a beautiful moral spirit. So don't arrest her or I'll put some arresting meat cleaver into a fucking painting. (laughs) That's what she said. People got very upset. (laughs) I want to talk about that, uh, but before I do talk about it, let me tell you where I'm coming from. I'm coming from quite quite a contradictory position. Uh, Someone who loves art and someone who who loves meat cleavers in art. Uh, I I have an art history degree. Um, I do. Um, Silly thing to do. I graduated 15 years ago in Australia. Whoa. Art history in Australia, guys. It's like training for a sport that doesn't exist, you know? (laughs) Looking at a lot of pictures in books. It's primary school. I don't know why I did that. It was a silly thing for me to study. Very silly. You know, art history is a very, you know, it's an elitist sport. And I'm not from that world, you know? I'm not from education, money, even that much chat. But there I did it. I did it. It's not really my world. (laughs) Really, it isn't. I was never going to get a job there. Could you imagine me working in a gallery, you know, like wearing an asymmetrical woolen poncho, (laughs) a severe fringe and aggressive jewellery, having the opinions? (laughs) No, I'm bored already. (laughs) I'm a stand-up comedian, which is lowbrow. This is where I belong. You know, uh, art history is in the highbrows, you know, like that's uh, civilising. It's the uh, the highbrows like the theatre and the opera and, um, (laughs) you know, that shit. Needs a translator, anyway. And um, comedy's lowbrow. It's where I belong. Sorry to break it to you, but no one leaves a comedy show a better person. You're just rolling, (laughs) rolling around in their own shit. But, um, so I studied art history. It's a useless degree. Um, oh, well. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a bit sad, though, that, art, you know, it's sort of sold to us as an elite of sport. I did get a lot out of it. No money or respect, but I did still... I did. I, I learned a lot. I actually understand the world that I live in because of art history. I have a good handle on what's happening because of what I learned from art history. I understand art... But I also understand the world from my... I understand this world and my place in it. I don't have one. <laughs> and do you know how much time that has saved me? I'm quite old, but my skin, isn't it great? Because I haven't wasted any time trying to find my place in the world. It doesn't exist. I've spent that time napping. It's very... <laughs> I've napped a lot because art history taught me this uh, masculine of centre lesbian situation you see before you. It's made up. It's new. Like, if you go into a ye olde gallery, you know, with all the ye olde art on the walls there, there's very clear evidence that women have existed for a very long time. Longer than clothes. But this situation, we're not hung on gallery walls. Historically, just hung. I look at 
at all these. There's plenty of ladies to look at. And uh, I don't look at the history women on the walls of the galleries and think, gosh, I'm the same species. <laughs> because art history taught me that I'm incorrectly feminine. Like, I'm incorrectly female. I'm wrong, doing it wrong. Right? Because art history taught me there's only two types of women. A virgin or a whore. That's it. <laughs> and people think Miley Cyrus and Taylor Swift invented this binary, but it's been going on for centuries. <laughs> You got two, two career paths, girls, always. Virgin or whore. And we're always given a choice. This is the trick of the patriarchy there. Always, it wasn't a dictatorship. It was, yeah. <laughs> but it was, it's choice. We're given a choice. We grow up to be anything you like, girls, anything you like. Virgin or whore. <laughs> Take your pick, ladies. Choice, your choice. Oh, you don't leave me a whore. Here's a hint though, the one we encourage, wrong. <laughs> and the other one, impossible to maintain. Take a <laughs> And I don't fit easily into either category, virgin or whore. On a technicality, I'd get virgin. But... <laughs> No, no, I look at these women, I don't feel like the same species. Look, that I do, that, that history women, that the, the civilising art history has told me, incorrect. For a start, I can generate thoughts in my own head, unprompted. <laughs> just add another one, there it is. <laughs> oh, they just keep happening, cascading. Now, art history told me that women, historically, have not had time for that kind of folly. Too busy with the number one hobby of history women, napping naked alone in the forest. <laughs> I don't have time for the think thoughts. I've got to be a wilderness porn tableau. <laughs> Another thing that I have biologically that I've been taught is very unfeminine very unladylike, is I have a functioning skeletal system. <laughs> I don't do any core work, but I still manage to be quite the upright situation, right? <laughs> but if you go into the gallery, you'll see all these history women, if they're not sporting a corset and or a hymen, they just lose all structure. <laughs> they're just flopping about, side saddle, tits akimbo, going, what does furniture? <laughs> No idea. Just go. No wonder we can't reverse park, ladies. <laughs> Dumb history women couldn't even reverse park their ass onto a chair. <laughs> I've seen more structure in a condom full of warm tapioca than I have in a Renaissance woman. I imagine. <laughs> Another thing that I do that's it's masculine, quite frankly. Borderline masculine makes me a bit of a man is that every day I leave the house, I have always finished the getting of the dress. I just, I just remember it all, all the buttons were, and I'm a very vague person to be honest, but that, oh, I really do manage consistently. And I pay extra care when I'm leaving the house to have my portrait painted. Never once. If I left the house and just gone, oh, you know what, today, I reckon I might just leave a cheeky one out. <laughs> nah. High art. High art. I'm calling it people, high art, my ass. The history of Western art is nothing more than the history of men painting women like their flesh vases for their dick flowers. <laughs> Very satisfying to say, but having said that, I'm not getting a job in a gallery, am I? <laughs> Do you know who I hate? Atheists. Idiots. I am one, but fucking idiots. Do you know what? I 
I just the biggest moron is an atheist who dismisses all the stories in the Bible. Just dis- not relevant, is it? Because it doesn't hold up in dinosaur court. <laughs> Fuck it. Art history taught me the power of stories. <laughs> They're very powerful. I mean, if only we'd remembered that recently and we wouldn't have elected. And, um. <laughs> stories. Stories are very influential. Fact. Fuck all. I don't hold any sway unless it's attached to a story people want to hear. Art history taught me that. Like, if you think the story of Adam and Eve is just a silly, stupid story made up by dumb history women, you're the idiot. You're You're an idiot. That story, like, the story of Adam and Eve digs much deeper into our psyche than any factoid could ever hope to hold. Right? Why do you think it is so easy to blame a woman for her own sexual assault in this world right now that we live in? Because Eve ate the apple first. She sinned first. So we blame. It is that easy. The way you tell stories is more important. You don't destroy them. We don't need censorship. We don't need to... Silent stories. We need to make them constructive. Eve might have sinned first, but I'll tell you what she didn't do. She didn't surprise ram the apple up Adam's ass. <laughs> she used language, and Adam made his own fucking decision. It's called consent. (laughs) Don't destroy art, is the moral of this story. (laughs) Tempting. The Rugby Venus uh, by the left that Mary put the meat cleaver into... People got very upset when she did that. They uh, likened her to a serial killer. As if she'd murdered an actual person. The rugby Venus was talked about tenderly. Oh, the proper portal. And Mary. Oh, killer. Now, seriously, slasher Mary, they called it. Now, the interesting thing about that is you need to know the rugby Venus was painted during the Baroque period in Spain. Now, it was Baroque. They needed to fix it. Be- <laughs> Don't. Don't do it. Don't. It's a good joke. Fuck you. Hey, do you know how hard it is to do jokes about art history? It is very difficult. It's a reason no one really does it. But um, <laughs> there were no nudes painted in the Baroque in Spain because of the Spanish Inquisition, which was heavily policed. This painting was painted as a private Commission, which meant it's porn. This painting is porn. I have no doubt that men have stood alone in front of that painting and marvelled at the beauty. (laughs) And by marvel, I mean masturbated. Men have jerked off to that painting. High art. (laughs) But don't destroy it. It's just theirs pretty violent but you know centuries of it no I'm not encouraging it um what I'm not doing here is finishing on a high (laughs) what I've done is I've given you several peaks throughout the whole set Suffragette facts. Sorry, that's all right. I just am a big fan of getting praise for having done my homework. That's all. (laughs) It's good. Um, (coughs) I mean, I feel silly now. I mean, that was two people clapping. That's not praise. (laughs) Yes. 
thank you. That, that was for me. I mean, that's fine. Just carry on. This is, this is much like how it was in the past. <laughs> Don't play the game. <laughs> oh, no, he's a man in a top hat. <laughs> it's funny, you put the clothes on, you do become a bit more of a dick. <laughs> All right, here's my fact. On census night in 1911, Emily Wilding Davison spent the night in a cupboard in the House of Commons, so she could put down on her census return that her address was the House of Commons. Oh, ever more Brilliant. reasons to love her. Yeah. Um, Suffragettes did lots of fun things for the census of 1911. Lots of them didn't bother um, filling it in. Um, lots of them wrote, uh, no persons here, only women. Um, Lowe's put occupation suffragette. And um, there was a thing for infirmity. And uh, under infirmity, they put disenfranchisement. Oh. Which is pretty cool. Now, Millicent Fawcett. Millicent Fawcett, who we're getting a, uh, a statue of in Parliament Square this year, at last. Um, first woman in Parliament Square. When she joined the London Society for Women's Suffrage, was 19. When the suffrage bill got passed in 1918, she was 70. Wow. Yeah. So the fact is, let's not give up. We've come so far, we've got so much further to go, and if Millicent Fawcett teaches us anything, it is stick at it, because we'll get there. Mm. Oh, it's really serious. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, it's a bit serious. Oh, and, 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 you know, bums. We've done enough bums, God. Um, Look How right do you up. suggest I don't know about the forces? Yeah. I am the forces society. Yeah, no. All right, she's she's right though. If anyone doesn't know about the forces society, look them up. They're amazing. I mean, feel free to plug away, everybody. Yeah. Anyone else got anything? No, no, bitch. That's a terrible idea. Sorry, my bad, my um, bad. But good, good there's, plug. There's two thousand people. Here. Yeah. I was very keen on the eighteen fan club when I was growing up, but it's. <laughs> I don't think that still exists. So don't look that up. Look up the forces society instead. <laughs> Save me, Margaret. Um, yes, hi. Uh, yeah, so, uh, I, I, I was looking at um, lots of anti-suffragette posters, because obviously there was a lot of anti-suffragette propaganda, and I noticed that a lot of them showed <clears throat> the terrible idea of men having to look after their own children, <laughs> sometimes in the middle of the night. <laughs> and, and, it, and it's always like... You don't want this, do you? You know, it's like this is a terrible, terrible thing to have to do. And what I kept thinking was, um, this probably backfired because weren't there loads of women looking at these posters and going, actually, that's really shit. (laughs) What we're doing is, is, that is, that's really boring and tiring. I I mean, don't get me wrong, I do, I I, I love my children. I do do love them. (laughs) But it is, it's a bit shit looking after them sometimes. Well, yours are awful. Thanks. (laughs) Thanks. <laughs> and there was another, actually, there was another one which, which showed a man getting measured for trousers by a sort of sexy lady tailor yeah. and his wife coming in and catching them. And I, I don't know about you, but that seems quite a niche problem <laughs> to me. <laughs> but it does make me think that this is where Mike Pence has been getting all of his ideas, <laughs> is that 19th century did propaganda. She, did she catch him because she was on her way to vote? Yeah. <laughs> or she on the way? She was out of the house, so it gave him an opportunity to. I mean, none of it. Keep women at home. home. I, no, I, it doesn't, doesn't make any sense. make sense at all. Um, I have a telegram. <gasps> what? what? Indeed. It a really telegram. is 1918. It's, 1918. <laughs> it's a telegram, completely unplanned. So this is from Susan Wacoma. <laughs> and she has a message for all of you. Uh, I'm just going to read it. The telegram. Do it. Dearest guilty feminists, I'm sorry I can't be there with you in the big fuck-off palladium tonight. (laughs) I'm absolutely gutted, but I would like to buy a flat one day, so off to L.A. I go. (laughs) I mean, good for you, Akoma. Right. I'm a feminist, but I'll be fucking livid if all you feminists have a good time without me. (laughs) Now, Deborah promised to read this out. Bish is filling in, because it would be uncouth. Deborah promised to read this out, so I'll insist that she read this next bit out, and I'll hit the roof if she doesn't. All we can do is try, and leave this world a bit better than we were born into it. And I think we can safely say that Deborah is doing exactly that, and making the rest of us look like lazy fuckwits. (laughs) 
Also, Team Guilty Feminist, please give a massive warm round of applause to our Queen, Deborah Francis White, and have a wonderful feminist night. Hello, hello, hello. Susan McComer is overly sentimental and heavily medicated a lot of the time. That's what people don't know. BAFTA breakthrough, but I mean, it's all prescription stuff, don't worry. Um, are you ready for our next wonderful panel? Then please welcome to the stage Zoe Williams, Ash Sarkar, Jess Phillips, and Jess Foster Q. Zoe Williams is a Guardian columnist. Uh, Some recent columns she has written on uh, feminist issues include Consent, Hashtag Me Too, and The Weinstein Scandal. Ash Sarkar is a senior editor at Navara Media and a lecturer in political theory at... Yes! (laughs) ...at Ruskin, and the Sandberg Institute in Amsterdam, which sounds glamorous because it's not here. (laughs) Her work focuses on race, capitalism, and power. And Jess Phillips... MP in the house. Don't really need to tell you anymore. Uh, and Jess Foster Q, as usual. <laughs> Woo! Jess Foster Q will be representing. Jess Foster Q will be buttoning this intelligence with gags. Um, uh, so the first question I've got for you is Amber Rudd, the Home Secretary. Mm-hmm. Yes or no? Has no. no. <laughs> I'm going to have to ask. Oh, no. Um, Amber Rudd ha- was asked, would you pardon the suffragettes? And she has said that... Um, it. She is certainly looking into it. <laughs> into, but she said yes. she can only look... Yes. Too short she said she can only look into individual cases. She said, instinctively, <laughs> I can see where this campaign is coming from, but in terms of pardoning for arson or violence, it's a bit trickier. Too I'm going to throw this to you. Surely, if a female Home Secretary owes her job mm-hmm. to the suffragettes, <laughs> how do you yeah. feel about that guy? I mean, if I, they hadn't started to get I, heavy, none of this would have happened. They tried peacefully for decades. They did try. It wasn't the first thing they did. Was to I was else. on the same TV programme that Amber Rudd was on when she said it this morning. <gasps> so I woke up this morning and it's ten past six. I was sat next to Amber Rudd having my makeup done. Then she went on and said this... And I was on with Anna Subri, who's normally just like, you know, she'll say fucking anything, won't she, really? <laughs> um, and bless her. Um, <laughs> and Amber Rudd basically uh, said this. And then they asked us, Piers Morgan, asked me and Anna Subri, and I said, oh, yeah, just pardon them. And Anna Subri said, yeah, just pardon them. And they said, oh, well, but what about the violence? Are you saying violence is justified? And I just went, yeah. <laughs> and, and then Anna Subri was just like, oh, well, obviously not. Um, but, yeah, I mean, the end justifies the means. Of course, Amber Richard pardon them. I mean, the suffragettes weren't that great with bombs. They weren't that great with technology. I mean, it's awkward, but they did fulfil a certain amount of stereotypes there. <laughs> I mean... One of the things that I do want to say is, why is it that as feminists we're so concerned with pardoning women who are long dead? Why not pardon the guy who got six months inside for stealing a bottle of water during the riots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why not release the women who are banged up in Yarl's Wood right now for doing nothing other than coming oh, to this brother. country to seek a better life? Why not continue in the vein of the suffragettes agitating for widened political participation by, I don't know, giving all prisoners the right to vote? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right, Ash. You are right. I feel if the suffragettes were here, they wouldn't be saying, could we talk about people who've been dead 100 years? <laughs> they want they, No. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they wanted to commit criminal offences. That was the point. They intended to be rebels. There is, there I is, wouldn't want pardoning. There is, like, a political problem, isn't there? As soon as you start posthumously pardoning people, it's like, Alan Turing, you're pardoned for being gay because you did so much good war work. <laughs> you're like, well, is that the right frame? <laughs> 
Should, we, should we be talking about whether criminalisation of homosexuality is wrong? Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. You can't say only the gay ones that are famous and did stuff. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. we actually like now. Go, oh, we wouldn't have the computer, so yeah. All and right. the rest of you, all the other gay ones, unproductive no. Unproductive waffers, you to, can rot yeah. in hell. To be fair, the Act of Parliament would have pardoned everybody. Yeah, would the, it? the Alan Turing Act is actually about pardoning everybody. Oh, is oh, it? Sorry, yeah. It's, inclu- it's an well, inclusive pardon retrospective. Me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Don't mean to sound I, like, you know. Well, I think and that was the city question, Dibs. <laughs> Amber Rudd. No. <laughs> I think that was Jess Foster Q just coming out and then immediately, <laughs> as her first act, rejecting Amber Rudd. Um, so, Ash's point is a really good one. What are we doing about people now? How can we be more like the suffragettes? I mean, I want to do something between marching and bombing. I've got the answer. Uh, is it communism, Zoe? Yeah, it's fully automated luxury communism. No, it's not. <laughs> what is it? What is it? Zoe? <laughs> well, no, it, this is just a Trump point that like, we're kind of building up to these huge protests against Donald Trump, and it is quite exciting. You know, I'm knitting my hat. <laughs> it looks like a vagina as much as anything I could knit would ever look like the thing I intended it to look like. Um, but there is a purpose in... You could actually turn an anti-Trump mobilisation into if trade with a lunatic isn't the answer, what is the answer? And then the only answer is the EU. And your <laughs> And what I think the suffragettes would be doing now, which is what they did, is saying, how can we link that person with that person and that person? How can we link another Europe is possible to feminists, to momentum, to the Labour Party that isn't momentum? So are you suggesting create your own European Union through feminism? Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think... I think there's a danger in saying, oh, the suffragettes would have done this or the suffragettes would have yeah, wanted no, that, that because true. they weren't a homogenous movement. So you had Emmeline Pankhurst, who, amongst other things, really fucking loved colonialism. You had her sister, Sylvia Pankhurst, who really didn't like colonialism and was an avowed socialist. I know, and I love the way they always say they didn't always get on, but they came together for this. Except and it's one died like, <laughs> like a pauper's grave in Ethiopia know, and the other didn't. I know, but it's like, you know, they got over the colonialism shit. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from the one who then went on to join the British Union of Fascists. There was always that awkward moment. But I'm sorry, I'm, I'm so sorry to be like such a like historical Debbie Downer all the time. I'm just like, your fave was definitely racist, but that's why they brought no, me listen, on to listen, history things. is awful. I mean, I think we can all agree, history's a cunt. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's just awful. It's just, con- it's just one awful thing after another. <laughs> but we look back yeah. for the wonderful things that have changed the world, and we have to look back at the same time with nuance and say... But they're useful they're- lessons. They're very useful lessons. So we've got a feminist movement which is broad enough to encompass everyone from our head to Mimi to Theresa May wearing a This Is What A Feminist Looks Like t-shirt. Well, no, so there is no... <laughs> what does that count? <laughs> Well, yeah. exactly, so I'm saying is that like, we, we have to be... I'd have gone for Beyonce to Mary Beard as my spectrum. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if, if Tezzy M makes it. I don't know. I've been calling Maybe her, like, Tresemme until I'm... someone corrected yeah. me recently. But the thing is, the... <laughs> But the thing that I'm saying here is that we have to actually, rather than relying on, I think, some quite lazy forms of, like, you know, oh, well, you know, we're all feminists here. It's actually be yeah, a yeah, bit yeah. bold and assertive yeah. and, like, put out, and this is an unfashionable word, ideology on the fucking table. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. start having some antagonisms which are constructive as well as destructive. And we can look back at the splits in the suffragette movement and, I think, learn productive lessons from them. It's not just about being, like, your favour was racist, but also your favour was racist. <laughs> <laughs> Women Uh-oh. don't all agree, right? So, you know, part of being a feminist means you don't all have to agree. And I had an argument with another prominent feminist on Twitter. <laughs> we were arguing about Harringay. And I thought I was right, obviously, because I am. And, <laughs> and then loads of people were like, guys, guys, I thought we were all on the same team. You say, no, 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 no. You can all want equality for women and still really disagree about PFI. You've got to be able to do that. Yeah. We need plurality of thought, clearly. Ash, what can our podcast listeners do (laughs) if they are not women of colour to be more supportive of women of colour? Something I had to learn to do as a cisgender woman or as a woman who's got secure immigration status in this country is just shut the fuck up and listen. Like, like, it's not that deep. 
deep. Like, it's honestly not that deep. We all go yeah. through life at some point being like, hang on, I'm not the only person on the planet, and my experience of living on this planet is not representative of every other person on this planet. And it's only when we get into political spaces that we have this frankly batshit assumption that our subjectivity can stand in for everyone else's. And that's the only time that we do that. So I think that we just have to behave like normal people who are capable of emotional intelligence, listening, learning, adapting, being alert to other people's vulnerabilities and thinking about what we can do to help lift them up and what they're telling us that we can do and then do those things. It's really not rocket science, it's just feminism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Seeds not also, one. Oh, uh, also, yeah. Oh, yeah, you, can also, you can also go to support.navaramedia.com and give me all your fucking money. <laughs> it also just sounds like empathise. Yeah. If you identify as someone who is down for liberation politics, whether it's socialism or whether it's um, anti-racism or whether it's trans rights, the basic principle is that we don't want humans to live miserable lives yeah. and that we want to empathize with suffering. Like, you really don't have to have read absolutely everything that Gramsci's ever written. I've to become... never read any of it. <laughs> <laughs> His prison notes are actually sick, But I've though. been to Yarlswood actually about four sick. times um, and released women from there. And, and I think that it's up to women like you who've got power to make That's decisions in yeah. legislation to lobby for an end to the hostile environment policy, to end immigration detention across the board, not just yeah, for yeah, women, yeah. not just for sexual assault survivors, for everyone. And you've got that power... And there should be a social movement backing it. And that's yeah. what we don't have at the moment, is a truly social movement, rather than just people popping off on social media. Yeah, that's definitely true. Social media is not a social movement. Ja Rule so, said that. <laughs> he said some other good things. So what do we need to do to make our words into deeds, as the suffragettes had it? The first thing I would say is that you have to actually do something saying it. I spend all my time with people just saying things. And I'm so it's... sorry, this is a podcast. Sorry. <laughs> but it's, I, I mean, it I don't mean... It retitled people this. saying I mean, like, things. I go to meetings where it's just talking, talking, talking about what, you know, are the problems, and it's just like, oh, can we just actually get on and do something? Jess, it's what you're saying. I should get those dance lessons. <laughs> yeah, you should. I mean, here's okay, something great. that people can do. Non-violent direct action. Because I'm not allowed to say you can do violent direct action, otherwise I'll get arrested. So forms that non-violent direct action can take can be as simple as a boycott, or it can be doing something like, I don't know, de-locking yourselves together, getting on a runway and stopping a fucking charter flight. D-locks are actually quite cheap. You can get them from your local Halford. Um, Wilco's. DM me afterwards. But that's something that will physically stop a deportation. Or going to the airport where you know that a charter flight is going to happen. You talk to the other people who are going to be getting that flight. You talk to the pilot and you say, don't do this. You cannot do this. And that has prevented charter flights before. And those kind of actions would support a woman like Jess standing up in Parliament saying, let's end deportations, let's end immigration detention, because there's a really disruptive and effective movement backing it. Because you can't, as great as some of our MPs are, you can't expect them to be doing your political thinking for you. No. You can't expect a podcast to do your political thinking for you. You've got yeah. to do it. I mean, there was this... Um... There was this, there was this, when the Scottish referendum was running, Common Wheel started and they did this, it was, it was a kind of grassroots from nothing. A lot of people think the guy who ran it was a bit of a dick, but I didn't know him, so I'm not going to comment. And it was really incredible, actually, and it obviously it had that pivot point of the referendum, but it took a completely boring conversation about where a border was. It's like, oh, yawn, I don't want a border, fuck off. I don't, need a, I don't want a passport to go to Newcastle. And it turned it into a conversation about what kind of Scotland you wanted to live in. And it, it was incredible, actually. And, OK, they lost, and I wanted them to lose because I felt the way the morning after the referendum, the, the way I felt the morning after my first marriage, which was, like, great that I'm not alone. Sorry for him. <laughs> um, but, you know, the, actually, when you spoke to the people who started it, they said the amazing thing about Commonweal is that 
you can imagine having a common wheel running club, you can imagine having a common wheel book club, you can imagine having a political event, you can imagine having a barnstorm, you can imagine them leafleting, you can imagine them doing a whole range of normal human behaviour, a lot like the trades union movement in the 1920s. You can imagine them doing these things together because they're people who kind of love each other and listen to each other. And I think that is what political activism is really, is that once you get into a stage where you can imagine doing everything in your life with the people, then you've made a movement. And I kind of do see that at the moment. I do see people kind of building things where they're not just people who turn up every third Tuesday to shout at each other in meetings. I see people investing more of their actual self in their political self. And I think that's the first thing to do is, where's your actual self? And is that where your political self is too? I feel like, because I, I went to university in 1997 um, when the, we didn't have feminism, we had girl power. And oh, yeah, I remember. Uh, I quite yes. enjoyed girl power. Yeah, me too. It, it was, was but, but lager. The... It was all lager. I, I love <laughs> lager. It but... was lager, Ash. You would have liked it. <laughs> I'd come out of a quite serious religious cult where feminism was not allowed. Oh, yeah, that's... And so I was thinking, oh, great, you know, and I'd always been this sort of rabble-rousing feminist. I mean, as far as you could be as a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> I'd say things like, when God brings the new order to earth, I don't think women are going to be in subjection to men anymore because we'll all be perfect then, and I think it's just a temporary measure. That was the kind of feminism <laughs> I accept. That was a big deal. That was a big, big deal. I got told by the elders I couldn't say that anymore. But that's um, put your personal self into your political self. It did. So when I came out, I was like, where are all the feminists? But I felt like feminist was a word that went before studies. We were not talking about feminism, and I remember talking about it and trying to like, get other women to talk about it, other young women, and they would say, oh, well, it's all equal now, and, you know, it looks like you're trying to sort of get ahead by pretending things aren't equal. And I feel if the suffragettes had come back when I was at uni, they would have been really disappointed. And I feel like if they came back now, they would be excited, because I went on this period poverty march, organised by Amica George, who's 18. Um, and uh, with some other very, very, very young activists. And uh, I was unbelievably surprised how many... There were children there. There were, there were teenagers, it there were students. Brilliant, yeah. And I feel like something's happening now, and it's about a movement as a creative force, not just something that stands against. Because of social media and because of podcasting, yeah, you can much, create yeah, and definitely. invent. We don't just have to be anti the patriarchy. We can be pro something for ourselves. And we need to be writing, creating, doing these kind of inventive outrages, stopping planes leaving the ground through invention. And that's what really excites me. We can collaborate, we can create, we can play, we can make. And we don't just have to be anti, we can be for. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. Um, Amica and Scarlett and all of the gang who organised the period poverty thing, that is a really practical thing that will definitely influence the place where I work and already is, and they're already coming in with specific actions. Um, oh, yeah, they've been in like three or four times. Although when they first came in, they were just like, we just want to listen to you all talk. It's like me and Paula Sheriff talking about periods and other MPs, and they were like, we just want to sit and listen to you. This is amazing. Like, you're normal, and you just talk about periods. But what they did was they created a buzz for something through social media, through all those things, but they turned a conversation into a direct action that then will definitely, by International Women's Day, I think, lead to action around period poverty. That's incredible. <laughs> so, if you don't know about the period poverty movement, um, Amy George, periods. an 18-year-old... Can I, can, I, can I just stop for a second? When... The kind of feed-in is too fast, and you have a direct action, and then politicians respond immediately, and then period of poverty is solved. You get a kind of immediate victory, and nobody's saying, hang on a second, if that person can't afford tampons, she probably can't afford socks, and she probably can't afford to pay her rent. But no, but, but, but the point is that the Labour government... No, not your fault, a long time ago. It was never about... Why is it that your full-time wages don't actually sustain you? But I think that's why feminism is coming back now. I don't think it's really got anything to do with social media. I think it's because, basically, neoliberalism is crumbling and it's dragging its carcass across the world economy with bits molting off of it. <laughs> we're, we're at... 
<laughs> we're, we're at tipping point politics, where yeah. either we win or they do. And in America, with Trump, we've seen what them winning looks like. It looks like a grotesque orange buffoon. <laughs> Meanwhile, the ideological heart of conservatism has had the you know, bottom fall out of it, and it's been replaced by ethno-nationalism. That's what the other side looks like. Yeah. What we've got isn't just, well, we're all women and we've got a shared gendered subjectivity. It's a chance to not live miserable lives and to address economic injustices, racial injustices, social injustices across the board. Feminism is one part of that political tapestry. It's not the whole of it, but it's certainly a set of values that's got to undergird the whole thing. But, we but fundamentally, it's we... about economic justice, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think so too. Except that, I'm afraid to say, that in the struggle for economic justice, it is always women who get sidelined. Yeah, but in the feminist movement, it's always women of colour and working class women who get sidelined. But also, we have also, to deal when with this. No, but the thing example, is, when, you don't, when, you don't talk about, when you don't talk about economic justice, women get shafted as well. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about feminist economic justice. It's well, addressing I, those problems. I, and Are I, you can I just say, I do agree with everyone, but I've just had an idea that if one of the ways that would help to bring down a chartered plane is if you held on to it, if you know that your ovaries are particularly heavy. <laughs> but look, this is good, because earlier we were saying we need to be able to disagree and have the difficult conversations, yeah. and here we are having them and still liking each other. And that's really important, to be able to disagree with people you like and stay on the sofa. And of course, you are right... <laughs> Uh, it's not enough to just say, here's a free tampon on your way, but it is enough for Amica George to say, I don't oh, know yeah. where, how to do it all, but I know how, how to, to do, do this, this thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and we need to be doing more of that. If all of us took one thing and said, this is my thing, I can't do everything, but I can do this thing. And if influential people said, look, my life's pretty great, what thing would you like me to champion? We can't say, because I can't fight for socks, I mustn't fight for tampons. No, 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 that's not the point. I know that you're not saying that. I know that you're not saying that. I'm saying let is The point is not about the person starting the campaign. Any person starting a campaign is brilliant. The point is about the establishment saying, well, we've got a campaign, we're fine. It's about yeah. response. It's not the campaigners. It's the yeah, people yeah, the who then say, OK, great. we're going to act on period yeah, yeah. We've we done it. We've done it. But that's Just up now. to We're us yeah. to ask again and demand that. again. Yeah, of course. We'll and then you start that. again. And ask for help. Ask your network. People are desperate to be... To, they, they, yeah, I want to help, want but to I don't help. know how to help. If you say, look, I'm going to take on this. Could you do the admin? Could you get people there? Could you tell people about it? You know, Uncle Jeffrey knows somebody who knows somebody. You know, that's how these things get done. You say, but can you write something that's stunning about it that thousands of people will read? Can you reach out to hundreds of thousands of young people and then can you sort of actually turn it into law and then can you just sit there and every now and again just pop in with a joke, mate? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Deb. I think you're doing a wonderful thing. You! You arranged that. I, You've arranged that. I am so sad to say we have no more time <laughs> so please give it up for Zoe Williams Ash yeah. Sarkar Jess Phillips Jess Moscacu and now not many of you will know this but the guilty feminist had a forerunner the guilty suffragette it was a podcast begun in 1909 <laughs> we take you there now Guilty Suffragette, thank you for downloading it. It means so much to us. Obviously, we're living in quite a patriarchy right now, so thank you for thank finding you. a wireless. If you enjoyed it, please do tell people about it. Yeah, it helps other suffragettes find the show, <laughs> which is really important right now. Yeah. So, okay, you ready, Emily? I'm ready. I'm a suffragette, but... 
if David Lord George came on a protest with me, I would vote for him. And by vote for him, I mean fuck him. What? <laughs> what? Miss Emily Wilden Davis, he's married. Mate. I don't care. He's married. Mate. I don't care. He is off the table. Suffer my jet. <laughs> Vote for my woman. <laughs> uh, I am a suffragette, but when I first went on hunger strike, I did lose six pounds and I was pleased to fit back in my wedding dress. Yeah. You're not allowed to say that. You're not allowed to say it. I mean, the, they are so bad. We get it, but come on, you look so good after one. Thank you. I mean, you look amazing now. Look I at that know. hat. Um, okay. Um, I'm a suffragette, but. Last time I went on a protest and we threw a brick through a window. A little bit of vandalism. Yeah, a little bit of vandalism. Cheeky little bit of vandalism. I deliberately threw my brick through office and I took a pair of shoes. <laughs> I'm sorry. And all the ladies were like, no, no, this has a bottom. I was like, oh, sale. She made off with them. I she made, made off, with, off them. with them. And they were in the sale. Why bother? <laughs> they were lace up. Come on. It's the only option we have is lace up. Imagine that. That is how hard things are right now. There are worse things, but only slightly. I'm joking. So I'm a suffragette, but um, even though the suffragette colours are, you know, purple and green and white, I just wear green because it makes my eyes pop. <laughs> we gave you three colours for a reason. So whichever one suits you best, wow, wow, wear wow. it. You can still protest and look good. Remember your colours, like your spring or summer, it's important. That's important. We want votes, but we want to look good too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so listen, um, you did a challenge this week, Emmeline. Emmeline did a challenge, a challenge yes, as normal. Thank you. So what was your challenge? My challenge was to make a bomb. Oh. <laughs> thank you. Some yes. bomb fans down Some there. Some bomb fans in. <laughs> Now, how did it go? Because I know bombs, ugh, they're tricky. They're so they're tricky. hard to make. That's why not everyone is doing it. So I had a sort of little recipe yeah. for it. And I thought, I started making it. You know what, I'm sorry. I bet men don't call it a recipe. What do you think they call it? A manual. A bomb ah, manual. Manual. Exactly. I think recipe's lovely. Thank you. Yes. I had a bomb recipe. <laughs> and I saw, you know, I had all the ingredients yeah, and the method yeah. and everything. I, Put it all together, and I was like, this does not look right. Uh, it's so hard when your bomb doesn't look right, because who do you go to? There's no Google. Exactly. It looked very lopsided. Anyway, um, it, that's why it's a challenge. Um, so I popped into the British Library. Yeah. I had broken after dark, and I put the manuscripts next to the St Cuthbert's Gospel, like Ooh, we talked nice. about. And then I just let it off. But it just sort of went fizz a bit. Oh, no! It just sort of fizzled out, which was a bit disappointing, oh. and I felt... Like a failure. No, you mustn't feel like a failure when I your did. bomb doesn't go well, off. Well, I did, Emily. I felt like a failure because I couldn't explode anything. <sighs> but that's what they do. That's what the patriarchy do. They make you feel like, oh, you didn't do a bomb, therefore you're a failure. No, you went in and you tried to kill people. Good on you. <laughs> Not kill, just hurt. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, just, just like make a point. Just like make a point. Um, now, is it time? Oh, yes, for... Oh, oh my God, we've oh so, we got God. an amazing we've guest. We've got an amazing <gasps> guest for you. Are you excited? <laughs> Well, he should be. Yeah, it's really exciting. She is an activist, a musician, a conductor. A conductor? Yeah. I, what? All the way from Australia and specifically South Australia, who have already got the vote. By the way. What? So please welcome Muriel, Muriel Matters. Matters. Oh, g'day, cunts. Muriel, thank you so much for joining us. And it is embarrassing for us here because I know you guys... Have kind of already done it. Yeah, like what honestly is going on? We're like, trying. Let, just, just quickly to put this in context, Australia got the vote in 1902. Say what? Australia. Australia. <laughs> like us. Like have you seen what we do? <laughs> you invented the language that is written on our voting forms. <laughs> I feel like we sent the good people over to do some good work, and now we need you back. That feels like crawling, but okay. Um, <laughs> they don't call you the boxing kangaroo for nothing, No, do they? they don't call me that. So, I... <laughs> a 
Um, but Mira, you did something recently, like genuinely did it, and I, we wanted the listeners to hear about it. It was a yeah, it was a big deal. Um, I got in a dirigible hot air balloon. It's when King Edward was opening the House of Commons. Yes, and what I did was I flew over the building, and then I got pamphlets that yeah. said vote for women. Nice, and that's our I message. Just, thank you, and I just like scattered them around. That's amazing. Like suffragette confetti, like suffragetti, which is also a really good carb substitute if you're cutting out pasta. You can just have suffragette. I'm spiralising at the moment. I'm just spiralising. How is that working for you? It's awful. It's terrible, isn't it? We had it last night. I hate myself. I'm really hungry. I... I hate to bring this up, it's awkward, but um, you did have the plan to oh, spread yeah. the pamphlets over the House of Commons, but okay. something went slightly wrong. What yeah. happened? Due to wind issues. <laughs> no. <laughs> that was the courgette. Um, I <laughs> Suffragette goes right through me. I, uh, due to wind issues, um, I, I drifted a bit and the pamphlets didn't quite oh, fall no, on the House no, of Commons. No. Yeah. Where did they fall? They fell on Wormwood Scrubs. Oh, no. Which and felt like in, insult to injury, to be honest. Yeah. And that's awkward because I don't know, how, is Wormwood Scrubs a particular hotbed of feminism? I mean, it is now. It I'm is now. It is. I mean, they got a lot of pamphlets. They're starting to think. Yeah. <laughs> well, there you go. You've changed from the inside and you've, you've hit straight to the prison system. I think that's, that's a great When yeah, those guys come out, they're going to be on side. They've got skills. I mean, they're already angry. Yeah. Which is what we need. We need some angry men backing us that up when exactly. we don't fight The it. problem, though, when I dropped the pamphlets, is it just, like, everyone was like, oh, I told you women can't navigate. Oh, uh, like, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. Muriel, I must say, even though it went wrong, the suffragette movement are so proud of you for taking Thank action. You. So proud. Thank you. You know, just give it up for Muriel Matters. Yeah, she's Thank doing you. what we want. Even known who she was till today, but they're a genuine <laughs> yeah. Australian suffragette that did it. And that's the thing with the suffragettes it's deeds, not words. Yes, we deeds want words. fires and balloons and smashing yeah. things and, and podcasts. They're and so podcasts. important. Yes. Yeah, they are. They really are. Now, listen, if you have been listening, I know it's boring. I know every podcast says it, but please do subscribe, rate, and review. <laughs> please rate and review. Yeah, and perhaps. remember, guys, give it five, five stars. stars. We've been the suffragettes. Thank you so Come much. On. show. Um, thank you so much for coming to the Guilty Feminist Suffragette Centenary Special. Tomorrow is day one of the next 100 years. And the next day is day two. Feminism is the fight for change to make the world a place of possibility, where girls, women, and non-binary people can thrive and society can live with the richness of our stories, inventions, imagination and spirit. The patriarchy fights for things to stay the same, and lately it seems to be getting worryingly sentimental about past glories. It is easy to feel that you and I are just us, and that we have no real power or influence, and that the difference we can make is too small to matter. But then that must have been how many of the suffragettes felt when they failed and failed and failed again. We have to remember that they tried for decades and they only succeeded once. Many of them did not live to see the promised land, but it did not stop them dying, knowing they glimpsed it, and saying, let my people go with their last breath. Hope is the chasm between what is and what can be. We live the hopes of those suffragettes. Their implausible dreams and impossible demands are our lives. We are the thing with feathers, and now we must take flight. Tomorrow, this year, next year, we invent, shape, and fight for the lives of unborn girls. Girls in utero in this theatre, and the daughters of those girls. Sometimes it seems like we are making slow progress, but one day our impossible fight will be their normal. Many British women and girls have no influence and some have no vote due to structural or economic oppression. It is our job as feminists to fight, not just to close our own pay gaps, but for those whose life is all gap and no pay. A disproportionate amount of women 
where women of colour, queer, trans or disabled live diminished lives with no hope of being heard or seen. We must let our representatives know that how they shape policy for our most disenfranchised sisters affects our vote. Millions of people around the world today have no vote because they have no state. Tens of millions of refugees, half of them women and girls, have no vote because the only place on planet Earth that it is legal for them to live is a place where they will die. Next weekend, I'm going to the Dunkirk Women's Refugee Centre to work with women there and record a podcast. There seems to be no fewer than three films showing at the cinema at any one time celebrating Britain's work in Dunkirk in 1940. But when people have escaped unspeakable terror and arrived to safety, hoping for a place to lie down, and the police pepper spray their children's sleeping bags and burn their tents, it is hard not to conclude that this is our darkest hour. We need people newly activated who bring energy and, frankly, naive optimism, as well as old hands who know what they're doing. Naive optimism is hope in its purest form, and sometimes hope is what refugees need more than anything, someone to hope with them and for them when they feel hopeless. If you have time but no money, there is much you can do. Charities need volunteers. If you have money but no time, there are many organizations that will happily redistribute your wealth. If you have time and money, well, come right in, because your life is about to get so wonderful. Your existential angst is about to disappear as the answer to the question, what's it all for, has arrived. If you have neither money nor time, but you have a WhatsApp account or a Facebook account, making friends with one refugee local or stuck in limbo somewhere can be such a lifeline to them. There's a 24-year-old lad called Musap I message a few times a week. He left Darfur at 14 and is now 24. He's still stateless. He feels there is nowhere on planet Earth that it is legal for him to live. He awaits a second rejection from the French government, unable to learn or work. His life is a bonsai. His heart is an oak. Sometimes he wants to tell someone that he's had a bad or a good day, and what does that cost us? Find a moussap, tell them you care. I want to share one story with you tonight. It's one among millions, but one I want your help with. My friends Yusuf, Amina, Ibrahim, and Bilal are a family of four. They were living in Mosul. He was running a hydraulic water centre. She was a teacher, and ISIS took over their area. They came into the school where Amina was teaching and said from that day on, teachers had to teach their syllabus of hate. Amina's friend refused, and they shot her dead in front of her. They began classes radicalizing their eight-year-old boy, and it was clear they were going to be killed, so they ran away from Mosul. The infrastructure in Iraq is so damaged that Yusuf was kidnapped for months by mercenaries. His brother, a doctor, had to sell his car to pay for his life. And at that point, they fled the country and made a terrifying journey, ending up in Austria. When I spoke to him first, it was because I'd looked through his Facebook photos, and I saw he was a friend of a friend... I just saw that they were incredibly similar to ours. They were family holidays, and they were children's dress-up day at school. And then they got very, very dark. And I started chatting to him. I asked him if I could send something to his children, and he immediately sent me back pictures of his house, this beautiful house. And I understood why he was saying, I can provide for my children, but this is what I've left. And I said, look, I understand. Look, I'm just from a luckier country than you. And he said, yes, well, Iraq was a good country before the war. And at that point, it is hard not to feel like you are the enemy. And I said, I, I'm really sorry. I said, our people didn't want the bombing. We, our leaders did it. And he said, I know, but thank you for saying that. And then he said, sorry about Brexit. <laughs> And I thought, holy hell, how bad is Brexit going to be? <laughs> we talked on and we bonded and, and we chat every now and again. And uh, recently he messaged me and said, I'm sorry I didn't say Happy New Year, but Amina was rushed to hospital and she's paralysed and would you pray for her? And I said, what's wrong? What's happened? And he told me a little bit about it. She was two and a half hours away. Now, she's just been told that she's going to be sent six and a half hours away to a hospital in Grants. 
Yusuf and his little boys, who are only eight and ten, and his wife Amina, they get 10 euros a week from the government, uh, food supplies, and a tiny little flat. So there's no way they can afford to visit her because it costs 270 euros for the three of them to get the multiple trains they need to get to see her, and plus a hotel for an overnight stay. So they've asked to be moved closer to her, and they've been turned down. The hospital recommended that they move the boys closer to their mother. They've been turned down. An MP spoke on their behalf. They've been turned down. She came home for a few days between hospital stays, and I Skyped Yusuf and said, how is it? And he said, the life has come back into this house. And she's being sent away today. So I'm going to ask for two things. One is, in order, because she's going to be there for six months, so in order for them to be able to go and visit once a week, they need 270 euros a week. With a bit of a buffer for food and other things, that's about 10,000 euros. So we've set up a GoFundMe site that you can access uh, through the Guilty Feminist website. If you could give anything, we'd really appreciate it. Every time I talk to him, every time I say, look, I'll try, or I'll, I'll speak to somebody, he starts to cry because somebody out there is listening. It's not that I'm so great, guys. I'm not such a great humanitarian. I got involved with refugees through podcasting, and then it's just hard to know people and not care. It's just like any of your friends, if they were stuck at a border or they didn't have a doctor, or they were, you, would, you would find a way to get to them. You would find a way to help. So I'm asking for help for Yusuf and Amina. If anybody in Austria knows anybody, if anyone knows anyone in Austria, if there's any influence, if there's any light that we can shine on this, then it would really help because they've been waiting for two and a half years. He can't work. He constantly volunteers for the Red Cross. He's learning German. His kids are winning prizes in school. If you could please help and do anything for them, I'd really, really appreciate it. But they are one story. There are tens of millions of people. So if you can find another person, another family... To somebody to reach out to, somebody to talk to. If this isn't what feminism is for, what, what is? And I said, to you, I said to him, look, we can try you know, with the government, see if we can have, find any influence. I said, but I don't know if it's going to work. And he said, trying is enough. And that's true. Trying is enough. We don't have to succeed. The suffragettes didn't succeed for 50 years, but trying is enough. I don't know how to do this. I'm super new at it. But I've realized I don't have to know. I have to know how to do one thing. I have to know how to do the first thing. And then the second thing will make itself apparent. And I truly believe we have a guilty feminist army. We can ask each other for help. We can connect to each other. And we can make a difference. Uh, lots and lots of small differences are the only thing that's ever changed the world. Thank you so much. You have been an incredible audience. It's just been so amazing to have this army of women come together tonight at the Palladium. Can you please give yourselves a big round of applause? And keep that applause going as I ask Ali McGregor and the Suffragette and Cars to finish the show.
You have been listening to The Guilty Feminist with me, Deborah Francis-White, produced in association with Guardian Live. The recording engineer was Chris Sharp. The producer for The Spontaneity Shop was Tom Zielinski. Thanks to Gina Decio, and thanks to Michael, Sophie, Bridget and everyone at Guardian Live, and Matt and his team at the London Palladium. For more information about this and other episodes, visit guiltyfeminist.com. Hello, it's Deborah from The Guilty Feminist. Just saying, if you would like to help Yusuf and Amina, go to guiltyfeminist.com and you will see on the third box, Help Yusuf and Amina. It's on the homepage. Click through and you'll be able to donate and hear their story. If you know any immigration lawyers or anybody else you think might be able to help them in Austria, please contact us at guiltyfeminist at gmail.com. If you are in Adelaide or going to the Adelaide Festival, there is a Guilty Feminist show on the 24th of February. And there are still tickets for that. The tickets for the rest of the Australian tour have sold out. So come and see us on the 24th of February at the Royal Theatre Adelaide. In this episode, the wonderful Ali McGregor opened and closed the show. And if you are in London, you can see her in her own show, Decadence, which I guarantee you is amazing. I've seen it a number of times. It's on at the Arts Theatre in the West End of London on the 22nd of February and the 1st and 15th of March. So book now for that. It's at 8pm at the Arts Theatre West End London. And you could also see her at the service at Café de Paris London. All the details are on alimcgregor.com. Click through there for tickets. And finally, here's a clip from Suffragedon. Uh, most of you will have heard this last week. It's our brand new hip hop musical. We currently have 12 minutes and we would like to extend that to a full length show. And for that, we need your help. If you go to guiltyfeminist.com, you'll see Suffragedon and you can click on the link that says contribute now or you can search for Suffragedon on Kickstarter. Please, please, please help us extend this and develop it. We have these most amazing, talented women of colour and we really want to pay them as if they're white men. So please contribute and be part of the development of Suffragedon and we promise we will make it worth your while with all sorts of extraordinary music uh, that you can carry as theme tunes for feminism. Thanks. And here's Suffragan. Our talk for it. Sacrifice for it. Won't give in to it. Yeah.